September 29, 2022. Chaos erupted in Mexico after an international hacker group leaked 6 terabytes of classified data from the Mexican government. Contained in this data were 19 golden rules cartel hitmen are to follow. And trust me when I say these rules will shock you. Let's talk about them. The Rule Book Guacamaya is an international group of hackers, and they're responsible for uncovering the brutal rules that members of the Gulf Cartel must follow. The leaked rule book became public when journalist Carlos Loret de Mola announced on his newscast that he had received six terabytes of hacked data from the Mexican Ministry of National Defense. Inside the data he received was classified information far deeper than just the rules of the Gulf Cartel. Other information found in this data were the Mexican military's links to criminal organizations, sexual abuse within the army, and the targeting of feminist groups that pose a threat to the top Mexican cartels. But none of these caught the attention of the people other than this particular rule book. According to the information provided by Guacamaya, this rule book was obtained from four Gulf Cartel Sicarios arrested in 2021. The book had a silhouette showing the state of Tamaulipas and the phrase, Regulation 19, written on the cover, and on the front page was a message that read, Every member must comply with these principles and be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice if needed. Rule 19 Priority attention will be given to any aid or emergency that the High Command has, overcoming any other assignment. Remembering that the escort is prepared to sacrifice his life if necessary to protect the command once the organization is on top of us. The 19th rule tells us that cartel sicarios must be ready to sacrifice themselves for their commanders. And by this we mean take a bullet for these guys if need be. And if they're to receive any form of aid, the commanders must receive emergency aid first before themselves. So if for instance a high profile drug lord is traveling with a group of hitmen, and they get ambushed on the way, these hitmen must put themselves on the line to defend their commander. And if by any chance there are medical supplies around, the commander must be treated first before any of the hitmen. And I think this kind of explains why drug lords always escape attacks from the Mexican military. And also why the hitmen are the ones who end up dead during cartel clashes. Rule 18 Anyone who's aware of an attack against the interest of the cartel and doesn't report or defend it, will be punished, as if he himself committed the attack, as well as if he betrayed the interest of the organization in any way. This rule focuses on treachery and compels every hitman to be loyal. Back in the days before El Chapo became the greatest Mexican drug lord, there were rumors that he signed a treaty with the Mexican government to rat out his allies as long as his men were protected by the government. The other part of the rule that talks about a hitman getting the same punishment if he doesn't report an attack can be explained with Felix Gámez Garcia and Barnabas Gámez Castro, who were killed on camera. They worked for Sinaloa and were killed for betraying the cartel. So let's say if these guys were under the Gulf Cartel, it's safe to say they would have met the same fate. And maybe if El Chapo was a mere hitman when working for the Guadalajara Cartel, he might have killed for the treacherous acts history holds against him. Rule 17 Every member receives a salary from which he feeds his family. For that reason, he has the obligation to put his effort and will at the service of the cartel. If for any reason you thought cartel hitmen didn't get paid, well, this is confirmation that they actually do. Still using the example of Gámez Garcia and Barnabas Gámez, they said they were paid just $21 for every smuggling job they took. That's 2-1. That's way less than minimum wage. But as small as it was, it was still a job hundreds of young Mexicans were ready to take up due to the overwhelming poverty in the country. Statistics show that more than 52 million Mexicans are living below minimum wage, while over 450,000 are employed to work with cartels yearly. And even though Garcia and Barnabas weren't directly hitmen, Julio Santana, the man who killed over 500 people, was paid just $70 for every kill. So no matter how little these guys are paid, they've got to show up, do what's needed, and pay full homage to the cartel. To us, that's kind of insane. But there are more insane rules than this, and we're going to get to them in a moment.
Rule 16. Any act of rebellion, insubordination, or treason will be severely punished as ordered by the High Command. June 12, 2022, an alleged cartel hitman, Jose de Jesus, committed treason against his cartel, the United Cartels in Petiban, Michoacan, Mexico. Jesus was working for the feared drug lord of the cartel, Enrique Chavez Baragan, also known as Guicho of the Kings. Baragan heard the news of Jesus and a few of his hitmen planning on dethroning him, so he set it up in the worst way possible. On the morning of June 12th, Baragan told Jesus to clean his pet tiger's cage, but in reality, he wanted Jesus to get eaten by this animal. So the moment Jesus stepped into the cage, he was rushed like bait. I mean, we can all admit he was pretty dumb for stepping into the cage in the first place, but that's beside the point. The main point here is Baragan made a video while Jesus wailed and screamed for help as this tiger ripped him to pieces. After a few minutes, a few other hitmen came to help Jesus out of the cage, but by then, he had lost a lot of blood and died en route to the hospital. That's a typical example of what happens when Rule 16 is broken. Rule 15 All members will refrain from giving information about the organization or mission that is entrusted to people outside the same system. This rule swears all hitmen to an oath of secrecy as regards the affair of the cartel. So no matter the level of torture, they are forbidden from divulging certain information to the public. This is why in exclusive interviews of former cartel hitmen, they usually put on a mask, and more times than not they have a device known as a voice changer altering the sound of that voice. Here's an example. <laughs> The cartel can't know who they are. It's also the reason why snitches get brutally killed in prison or in witness protection for ratting out their fellow hitmen. Rule 14. If the command designates a second or interim manager, he will be obeyed, as if the orders were issued by the same command, and comply with it to the letter. After El Chapo's third arrest and extradition to the United States in 2016, his son Ovidio Guzman Lopez was assigned to be the head of the Sinaloa cartel. And if we're being honest, maybe not every hitman or member of the cartel might have been in favor of that, but they had no choice but to obey whatever he said. And that's because of a rule like this. For the Gulf cartel, every hitman must be loyal to the person in charge, irrespective of personal feelings in a situation like that. Rule 13. Refrain from bothering or disturbing the peace of civilians, or carrying out acts of arrogance, abusing the resources that the cartel assigns. Protect and safeguard families and citizens, always treating them with respect and dignity. This one right here is one of the most important ones, because as a hitman for a cartel, there's a high tendency to grow to a level of arrogance and pride, knowing that there are only a few people who can actually put you in danger. However, most Mexican cartels usually shy away from unnecessary attacks against civilians. Even the CJNG, Mexico's most brutal cartel, has stated in countless interviews that they do not target civilians, but rather corrupt government officials and rival cartel members. So how do civilians end up in the mix of a cartel war anyway? Well, as much as this is a rule for the Gulf Cartel's hitmen, sometimes civilians just get in the way. An example is when Los Zetas broke out of the cartel in 2010 and during the cartel's war with U.S. agents that began in 1999. Rule 12 Any member who makes pretext to provide any support required or requested by the superior hierarchical command or counterpart in critical situations will be severely punished. There are times when a hitman might be resistant to granting the wishes of a superior commander. Let's say the commander wants the hitman to liquefy a dead body in acid, or they want him to kill an innocent civilian. This rule says that no member has the right to give a false excuse as to why they can't grant the commander their request. 
I mean, I can't say for certain what criteria they'd use to judge a false excuse, but at the end of the day, it's better for a hitman to do what's gotta be done and forget about it because the punishment they might end up getting wouldn't be worth the trouble. I'm talking about chopping a finger off or even blinding an eye. Those are the types of punishments that a hitman who flouts this rule is likely to face. Rule 11. It's the obligation of all members to maintain themselves in good physical and mental condition, as well as to encourage discipline to be ready for any mission. It's one thing to kill a person, but to kill multiple people every day? That takes a lot of guts. There's a saying that a man never remains the same once he takes a life, and certain people say that's true to some extent. But for these hitmen, they killed tens, hundreds, or even thousands of people by detonating bombs at times. Now, carrying out such jobs can have an effect on the mental stability of the hitmen. They might be losing their minds, becoming paranoid, maybe having frequent hallucinations, or even committing suicide. On the other hand, a hitman's mind should always be prepared for whatever's to come. If there's an attack on the commander, BAM! They gotta be alert to grab their guns and deal with that situation no matter what. The physical part also deals with treating bodily injuries as fast as possible to make them ready for the next fight. Rule 10 Must be punctual in any order. As well as maintain and keep in perfect operating condition all the resources under its protection, be it materials, equipment, weapons, vehicles, offices, and radio communications. Hitmen need to develop the habit of being early to their destinations, no matter the circumstance. The life of a cartel hitman is one that is constantly marked with violence, and to survive they need to develop a habit that stands out from the rest. How are they going to win battles and attacks if they can't do something as simple as being early to a meeting? For the Gulf Cartel's hitmen, the little things count, because it was by ignoring these little things that they ended up in the messy situation of losing their leader, Osiel Cardenas Guillén, to the United States government, and also losing the war against the Zetas. The second part of this rule talks about how hitmen should guard any property given to them by the cartel, and I think that also adds to the discipline the superior commanders are instilling in these men, to make them as clinical and professional in their dealings for the cartel. Rule 9. You must always remain clean dressed correctly in civilian clothes or in uniform and keep your clothes in perfect condition. Refrain from speaking improperly or with codes in public places or attracting attention, since all members represent the cartel and must put the objectives of the cartel first. Organization to personnel. As much as there is a large wave of cartel and drug trafficking activities in Mexico, Cartel members don't just pop out of nowhere waving a banner and telling the entire country they're cartel members, at least not in all cases. That's exactly what this rule is addressing. The Gulf Cartel believes that their hitmen should be able to blend in like a normal civilian without attracting as many eyes to them as possible. If they do, they could end up in a fight with other hitmen, arrested by the Mexican police or, worst case, dead. That's why they have to look and act like your average Joe, by keeping their clothes clean speak improperly, and just acting normal. If you think it's impossible, remember the body cam footage that got leaked of a high-ranking MS-13 gang leader who looked really innocent and harmless when the patrol cops pulled over his car? But in reality, he was the leader of the notorious bloodthirsty killing group. Believe me when I say that it's almost impossible to spot these guys if you're walking down the road in Mexico. Rule 8 all members will comply and enforce the orders issued by the command and accept with dignity in a material and moral way. No matter what they're told to do, they have to do it. Many times in the past, we've seen cartel members turn fugitive for failing to do whatever was asked of them by their cartel. This is why most members would rather kill themselves than do what they're asked of. And while different superior commanders can exploit this particular rule to their advantage, it's almost like these hitmen have sold their souls, bodies, and consciences to the cartel. In this case, the Gulf Cartel. These hitmen can be told to commit a suicide bombing, and they'd have no other choice but to actually do so. And even while incarcerated, 
A hitman can't still be controlled by the cartel. It's just how these things work. Rule 7 Every member with command must know their subordinates, their origin, their mentality, qualities, and defects, as well as have an inventory of the personnel, equipment, and the resources they have. Unlike other rules so far, this one isn't directed towards the hitmen, but rather at the commanders themselves. Now let's stop and think for a moment. What made Joaquin El Chapo Guzman so powerful during his early days as the leader of the Sinaloa cartel? Or what made El Mencho so good when he newly created the CJNG? Both questions have the same answer, and the answer is a good sense of leadership. El Chapo knew what he wanted, and he knew the men that could get it done for him. He was in total control of the cartel, having men do whatever he wanted. If a hitman didn't follow his orders, he got him killed in the twinkle of an eye. The same goes for El Mencho. He was able to recognize the talent of different deserted Mexican officials and recruit him to train his soldiers into a collection of war machines with lethal moving parts ready to take on any war. And I'm not glorifying these guys. No, 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 don't take it in that way. I'm just saying that their ability to identify their subordinates on a deeper level is what got them to that level they're at right now. Rule 6 There's subordination between members of the same grade or hierarchy, as long as they have a command assignment. Imagine that you have a team of employees who all hold the same job title or position within the company. Despite having the same rank, certain members of this team might be given additional responsibilities or tasks that require them to oversee or guide the work of their colleagues. These additional responsibilities are referred to as command assignments. In this context, it means that if there are two or more commanders having the same rank within the Gulf Cartel, the ones with the higher command have higher authority than the other members. This authority allows them to give directions, make decisions, and guide the work of the other cartel members who are expected to follow their lead. However, we've seen cases where the head of the cartel is killed or extradited to the US and lower-level commanders who have equal authority might begin to fight for that top spot. In this case, the rule doesn't really say what happens there, but more times than not, it leads to a split or division of the cartel into smaller groups. Rule 5 It's forbidden to express yourself badly about your superiors. If there is a complaint, it will be made known to whoever can remedy it, and you will not be given a bad example with gossip. Being part of a cartel involves a delicate balance of power, secrecy, and shared interests among its members. The fundamental purpose of a cartel is to collaborate and work together to achieve mutual goals, often centered around maximizing profits, exerting control over a particular market, and minimizing competition. However, despite the collective nature of cartels, Individual members might sometimes act against the overall interest by tarnishing the cartel's name in public. While cartel members generally benefit from maintaining a united front and a positive public image to evade legal scrutiny and protect their interests, instances arise where an individual member might choose to engage in actions that seem detrimental to the cartel's reputation. This can involve making bold moves or gaining attention through negative publicity even at the cost of temporarily damaging the group's reputation. Conflicting interests among cartel members can also play a role. Different members might have varying long-term objectives or strategies that lead them to take actions that appear contradictory to the cartel's goals. This misalignment can result in unintended consequences, including negative publicity that undermines the cartel's image. I mean, what's the point of being in a cartel and still tarnishing the cartel's name in public? While it sounds absurd, it's definitely something that would have happened on occasion before, so no need to talk too much about it. Rule 4 The orders will be issued by superiors in accordance with the organization's codes and the subordination maintained between hierarchical degrees or commissions. Why do you think for every attack carried out by the CJNG, El Mencio is the one held responsible? even though he wasn't actually the one who maybe detonated the bomb or fired the shots to kill a person? Well, that's because it's believed he must have ordered it. While the actual perpetrators of the crime are to be held responsible, El Mencho's the guy who ordered the hit, and as such, he has a hand in it. The same law applies to this rule for the Gulf Cartel. 
Orders flow from the top in accordance with the organization's codes, and as such, the men at the very top are the ones who need to be taken down first to scatter the organization. This rule also means that a common hitman cannot start a war with another cartel out of the blue. I mean, if they tried, they'd be dead before they know it, but that's a story for another time. Rule 3. Orders must be carried out accurately and intelligently. Without delays or gossip, you can only ask for clarification when they seem confusing. When a hitman is given an order, he has to do it, regardless if he likes it, how he feels, or what he thinks. The superior commanders don't care about all that. They care about seeing their mission getting accomplished. And for the hitman, he's only allowed to ask for more intel on the job if there's a need for it. Plus, there's no room for error. If a hitman fails accurately to carry out a mission, I think it's best not to report back, because they might end up dead. I mean, we heard the cases of Chapo's men turning themselves over to the police for fear of what El Chapo might do to them. Rule 2 The principle of discipline is duty and obedience. Commanding is as noble as obeying, and he who knows how to obey will command better. The first part of this rule tells us the motto of these hitmen. It's the principle by which they operate and the code of conduct by which they must follow. Almost every rule so far is embedded into this one rule, and if a hitman fails to obey this, then he won't be regarded as a hitman for the Gulf Cartel. This is how they built their legacy as one of the top cartels in Mexico. The Gulf Cartel always chooses dialogue rather than violence, but if it comes to violence, they're always ready to match the energy. And rule number one. Discipline must be rigid, firm, and reasoned by a superior towards his subordinates and counterparts. This rule is the founding rule on which the Gulf Cartel was made. The rule starts by portraying the significance of maintaining a structured and controlled environment within the Gulf Cartel. It emphasizes that discipline should be consistently upheld, and it should be enforced with strictness. This means that members of the cartel are expected to adhere to the established rules and regulations without exception. The rule also highlights the role of individuals in positions of authority, called the superior commanders. These higher-ranking members are responsible for setting the tone of discipline within the organization. Their instructions and decisions should be rational and well thought out, reflecting a sense of order and purpose. Furthermore, the rule extends the concept of discipline beyond just vertical hierarchy. It emphasizes that this strict adherence to rules applies not only to relationships between superiors and their hitmen, but also to interactions amongst peers and counterparts. This suggests that maintaining order and adhering to the rules is crucial not only within the chain of command, but also in the overall functioning of the cartel. It's believed that this document was written by the Scorpions, an important cell within the Gulf Cartel with a presence in several Mexican states. And since the booklet contains the map of Tamaulipas and an image of a scorpion, it's very possible that this book was made in Tamaulipas, because the Scorpions mostly operated in that same state several years ago. But that withstanding, these rules highlight the possible participation of deserters from the Mexican Armed Forces in the creation of this regulation. And that's because if you really think about it, some of these rules actually seem like commandments that have a military background. But when this booklet got leaked, many speculations began flying around that these rules could have been modified by people who belonged to the armed forces and turned into a possible ethical code for members of the Gulf Cartel, with the aim of instilling them in a similar form of obligation towards their leaders to achieve cohesion and discipline amongst the cartel's hitmen. It's an impressive rule book, but is the risk of being a hitman for this cartel worth the reward? We certainly don't think so.